you very much for having me here. Uh, as Professor already said, this was a joint work uh, together with people uh, from India. Um, it is muted on my computer. Uh, no, 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 just like turn the volume down. Okay. Okay. Just a try. Okay. Go ahead. Um, this presentation will be on surface codes. Uh, last week on the seminar, there was already an introduction of sorts to surface codes, but I will present it in more detail. Um, so in general, the contents are as follows. First of all, I will give a brief introduction to quantum error correction with just basic comparisons to classical error correction. Then I will present uh, the stabilizer formalism and how it works because it's very important because it's the basis of how uh, surface code functions. And then finally, I will give the overview of surface codes. Uh, and one of the most important parts of our work was utilizing the minimum weight perfect magic algorithm, which is a decoding algorithm, which I will also discuss. Um, a brief motivation because this work was mainly uh, computer science computer science oriented rather than physics oriented um, and finally i will give the proposed surface code design um, talk about how it works how it functions and finally we'll give the results that we've obtained First of all, a brief motivation for quantum error correction in general. Uh, here are presented uh, some metrics from IBM quantum computing systems uh, with the mean single qubit error rates. And just for comparison, the, what is considered now a good quantum computer nowadays would have uh, 10 to the power of minus three error rates, while to achieve large scale um, large scale utilizations of quantum computing, we would need 10 to the minus 14. Uh, so error rate. Now it's like one chroma, is one times yes. 1000. Yes. And we would like to have much better. So one times yes, a million. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that we can utilize mm -hmm. uh, algorithms like the flagship Scholes algorithm on actually large numbers. So now every thousand operations, something goes wrong. Yes. Okay. In general, like you can see that there is a new system which has half of that, which is much better in general, but not enough for large scale systems. Now, uh, this is a comparison. I will not be talking much about classical error correction because of how much it differs from quantum error correction, but let's give an example of what it is about. Well, uh, classical systems also have, oh, that would be great. <laughs> well, uh, classical error computers in general also are prone to noise, but on much, much smaller scale than quantum computers. But so the science of classical error correction is in general pretty advanced, mm, but I will tell you in a moment why we, why we cannot just utilize it in its entirety in quantum error correction. Um, so both quantum and classical error correction uh, use four basic steps, which is first we are given some information, which we will then encode in some larger system. Later, we will have the effect of noise. And after the noise, we will want to decode what errors happened and correct them. So for example, uh, the most basic example of classical error correction is repetition code. So let's say that we have bits because we will operate on bits usually uh, on classical error correction, which is let's say zero one. The classical example is that we have, we uh, copy each qubit, uh, each bit, classical bit, let's say three times in this uh, example. And then this is the encoding. Later on, we will have the effect of noise. 
we'll have the so this is the encoding where uh, we utilize redundancy so we introduce more bits that is necessary uh, and later on it's the effect of noise colored in red here so let's say that we had a bit flip so if we bit flips from zero to one or one to zero it's called a bit flip there is a quantum uh, similar quantum phenomenon uh, and then we can utilize something that is called majority voting so in each group of three we see what bit is the most common so in this case it would be two out of three uh, to decide our majority vote so for this we have three zeros obviously it will be zero so we decode it into a zero uh, here we will have one zero and one by majority vote, voting we have two out of three are ones so the third one we flip to one and then decode it so zip it back to both bits and then we can operate on it for practical reasons often the operations happen are defined on the trees not on ones but it's more of a technical detail now with uh, quantum error correction let's say also very very basic uh, code that is somewhat uh, analogical to the repetition code it's called the three bit bit flip code now if we have a qubit so in general we have a state i have to see how it's better for me to stand uh, we have a state uh, the general form with some amplitudes alpha and beta then we do the same thing we use uh, two more qubits to have alpha zero 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 plus beta one 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 then we have the effect of noise so here uh, we will have the effect of poly x uh, operator on uh, it's here so here it's uh, the one that ha occurred and for the beta here we have zero so in this case it would happen as a course of addition instead of so Maybe it's better to write alpha prime beta prime because the coefficients have changed, yes? In the third line. Well, yeah. this was like in a, um, it's a pretty common example that is found in uh, some books in general. But, well. Uh, I mean, the aim is that the second to last, uh, second to last state is equal to the second state. So that the alpha at the bottom is equal to alpha at the top. Yes. Uh, plus gamma plus delta. Yes. So normalization is a bit spoiled, so I would write change the letters into look at the longest point. Perhaps. But this is not a very minor issue. Okay. Perhaps. But in this at least we can see the, how uh, the majority voting could work here. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can see that we need to have three similar uh, bits. Mm -hmm. So we know that these are erroneous. And then we perform the decoding, and we are left with hopefully a state that is uh, the same. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, one of the problems with why this doesn't work as well as with classical error correction is that, first of all, uh, in repetition code, we can utilize a huge number of bits. So we can say 10,000 bits of redundancy. Here we cannot do that because qubits are costly. And of course, also noise is much more common in uh, quantum systems now um, some more properties of quantum error correction of why we cannot just copy repetition code which i think should be known to everyone but just to uh, tell them all in one place here um, first of all we will have many types of errors so here i would um, suggest a representation of for example, on a block sphere where we have a state represented by uh, a dot on the block sphere, then uh, we don't only have a bit flip. Something that will be utilized in this work also is a phase flip. So uh, if we um, apply a sigma z operator. But also, of course, just as I uh, showed you before, we can have um, a whole myriad of errors. Also, and uh, while we are at the block sphere representation we can move the state just a little bit as well not only the bit flip to the other let's say pole of the block sphere but we can just move it a bit it will be harder to detect then 
and because of the no clone uh, no cloning uh, theorem we cannot do the same that we did with classical bits where we look at them and copy them we have to utilize some more um, uh, let's say ingenious ways to deal with that and of course uh, tied to that is that if we want to look at the qubit we will destroy the superposition which we cannot and won't do now i shown you with the bit flip error how we can uh, correct one bit flip but now uh, important to this work we'll be correcting a face flip as well so in this work i will be using x as sigma x etc so uh, these operators are more commonly used in quantum computing now uh, if we want to correct a phase flip we will first put our qubit in a hadamard basis which means that we will just apply a hadamard to our state and then we can see this is uh, our qubit in the hadamard basis and then uh, an interesting thing to note is then if we apply the x operator it will act exactly as a z operator if you notice that uh, so if we apply it on minus it will put uh, a local phase on it and if we apply it to a plus it will stay the same similarly the z operator will act as a x operator in this case so then we can just perform the bit flip code and uh, then apply a hadamard again and we're left with to the original state so this is the most basic way to correct one of any error and i will just tell you in a second why that is not only x error and z error there are many models of uh, quantum error correction and what how we can represent the noise in this work well first of all let's say that an important property would be that we can represent a y gate by by uh, an x gate and a z gate with uh, an i in front of course so that's why we won't worry about the y operator in this work because we can also always represent it as an x and a z and later the one before it this is a theorem if we can represent any quantum gate let's say as a two by two matrix then um, we can represent any error as a linear combination of x y z and i and what it means in general that we can represent them using just x and z so this is why we're using just the bit flip code and having the basic gates of hadamard uh, x and z we can uh, correct any errors of course this has its limitations but they are good enough for uh, a lot of quantum error correction and important uh, thing in uh, the stabilizer formal formalism is a property that in the poly group if we take any two operators they either commute or anti-commute a and b here represent uh, represent any two operators it can be the same one as well okay are there any questions so far to classical quantum error correction So just a simple request. As you mentioned, the word stabilizer formalism. Maybe yes. Could you say what it means? That's what, that's, that's what we will be doing now. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the stabilizer formalism is a uh, building stone of surface codes, which allows us to overcome the limitation of not being able to measure a qubit. Mm -hmm. That's the general premise of the stabilizer formalism so now how it works this is a fairly simple example by which i hope to illustrate uh, how even more complicated systems will work let's say that we have two qubits uh, a system of two qubits and we have uh we, they will be measured by two operators xa which acts on qubit a and xb which acts on qubit b and similarly za zb so those are called the stabilizers and they will commute because they act on different qubits. The uh, calculation is fairly simple, but 
those two operators will commute, which means that uh, these operators will be compatible and we can measure them different times. Now, uh, as you can see in this table, here are, uh, is the bell basis for this state. And it has uh, a very interesting property as well. Well, look at those are the eigenstates of those operators. And note how uh, in each row, there is a different combination of plus one and minus one. It doesn't repeat even once. So now I would like to show you what would happen in case of an error. Hopefully uh, it will be visible on the board. Uh, on yes. That. Not this one. Oh. Okay, works. So let's say we have one of the, we are just working on the bell basis still. So zero, zero plus one, one. And they will have eigenstates plus one and plus one. And now let's say we will have an X error or on the second qubit. So this is called a bit flip. Now uh, our state will become zero one one zero, but note that uh, the eigenvalues of the state are minus one and plus one. And you remember that we can measure them many different times, so we can keep track of how they change. Eigenvalues of the joint. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is why we don't destroy the state here, but we will notice the change. Now there is a matter of how to see just that and be able to deduce what happened on more complicated states. I will show you how it works uh, later on. Well, uh, in general, they will project onto the other eigenstates by classical means we can track uh, how they changed and whether an error has occurred. Now we can uh, come to surface code. There is a picture there, but I drew it also on the board. It might be easier to explain other things there. So uh, in general, a surface code will be a lattice, a 2D lattice. There's a question? No? OK. Uh, a 2D lattice of qubits, which also have on them something called the part check so the stabilizer that we just talked about and then uh, the parity check which are the x and the z noted here are uh, will show us the okay there are two confusing things about surface code i will note them here so first of all here are eigenvalues but when we track them we only notice plus one or minus one and they aren't the same as the eigenvalues here, but the minus one denotes a change in the system and plus one means that it stayed, stayed the same. This is in general the formalism so, so of surface code, so I um, kept it here. So the qubits are uh, in the cells? Qubits are, the uh, yes, the qubits are here. In the yes, Very exactly. Good. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And here we have the parity check, so the stabilizers, which will note whether something changed or not. So for example, um, let's say that we had an error on a, oh, the second, first of all, the second confusing thing is that disease denote, denoted in the surface code, check whether the, there has been an X error. And the X notes whether there has been a Z error. But check whether there has been a, a Z error at one of those four corners. Look, you have a, a like, in a way, yes, like a, yes, like a small square. Yes, whether yes. there has been a change of the stabilizer. Yes. Yes. So what it means here is, for example, if we have, let's say, a Z error on qubit zero, yes. Yes. then we will see this. Yes. 
this is what we can see classically. We cannot see where the, it has occurred. A lot of different things. Before Z, capital Z was the, the single one digit gate signal. Yes. Z, and X was a gate sigma X. But here, you use those letters for different purposes. Yes. Yes, so this is a piece of wood. It's not, not the same. So here, let's say this X here is not the X gate, yes? Yes. So let's tell us again what this X means. It's a different thing. Yes, it's a, it denotes a stabilizer. It denotes a parity check. And the parity check is a stabilizer uh, which shows us the change of the eigenvalues. Yeah, but parity check is still an operator, but it's a sequence of operators. Yes, uh, it's in. So it's different there, yes? But why is it's it here, there? for yes. example. So, oh, and it corresponds. There are not the numbers here, but I wrote them here. So for it's, let's say, the numeration starts from zero, then we are going in the reading order. So then uh, X zero acts on qubit zero and one. So this will be this uh, operator, this parity check, because it acts on qubit zero and one. Those are the operators on the, those particular qubits. You mean this, right? Well, this is the parity check. So it, cha it checks the whole operator and then uh, the change in the eigenvalues. And those are operators which correspond to specific qubits. Okay, sorry, but it's a bit confusing. But yes. Fact, before you use capital letters, Roman letters, now you take yes. it to language, which is not correct. Yes. So X naught is just the X gate on qubit naught, yes? As simple as that. Now, a product of those two, so two operations X are now called capital X. Yes. And the zero denotes parity checks, okay, it's kind of a labeled position at this lattice. Yes, exactly. But I think from less experienced audience, it's good somehow to um, make the notation more consistent because before capital letters, I know. Roman were gates, and now here you change them uh, spontaneously into slang. Yes. And I now you change it spontaneously notation because capital letters do nothing different. I agree. This yeah. is a trap for, for us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Those, uh, this I, I, wondered, I don't know what are the numbers of the qubits on the lattice. Is those are just, uh, yes, I will ex explain it now. So uh, those are the data qubits, which represent a logical qubit. So just as we had in the classical error connect or correction, where we had zero, 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 instead of just one bit zero, that's called a logical bit. So here, a logical qubit in quantum error correction will be uh, introducing redundancy. So here, instead of just one qubit, this would be the whole logical qubit. And it consists of all nine of those data qubits. Does it answer your question in a way? Yes. Okay, and they are numbers of one, one, yes. nine, and we do not perform any, uh, any operation on the nine qubits, yes, because the number is of uh, zero, zero, oh, zero, zero to oh, eight, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Now I see something. So, one uh, indices denotes vertices of the lattice one two three four five up to eight or nine yes i uh, up to eight yes and they are here used as labels and then ca yeah. capital letters containing the parity check mm -hmm. label position in, in this lattice yes so they label the yes. not vertices but uh squares the squares yes, yes. Uh, Yes, yes very, very exactly. Good. And uh, it also utilizes something called the nearest neighbor uh, interaction. Yes. interaction. So a qubit will interact just with the qubit which are next yes. to it. Yes. Because physically, this is easier to realize. In the what happens if the error is something different than just plain X? So that's, uh, I mean, just you know, random notation or whatever. So uh, we, first of all, assume that it will be a linear combination of X and Z. Mm -hmm. 
but otherwise here we will just be able to notice x and z or you know x and z so if it's x times z we will notice it uh, so maybe before further questions i will just tell you in general how it works so the surface code cycle it is called so the encoding the noise and then decoding of the surface code so first of all we will initialize uh, the x and z syndromes um, and they will be entangled using the not gate with the nearest neighbors uh, then we will perform something called error syndrome measurement where we measure the parity checks so we will measure uh, just the, the well the squares here uh, the operators which correspond to the squares obviously and then later on um, we will perform the decoding so we will see that and by means of some algorithm a decoder we will try to guess on which data qubits an error has occurred now it might be more confusing because for example um, let's say we have an x error on zero and one then the parity check will change from plus one to minus one and then to plus one from minus one again to plus one i confused uh, this a little bit so again what we will see if an error x has occurred on zero and one we will just see plus one so our decoder will uh, will think that nothing has happened because zero errors is more likely than two errors so this is why it won't get detected and the surface code unfortunately suffers from these types of errors just uh all right and are there any questions oh and if an error has occurred here it, it's called a logical error okay uh now i've already mentioned it but we have something that the whole qubit is a logical qubit but we also can have logical errors which happen when uh, something is on the all qubits from one side to the other okay now uh, i can also introduce the notion of a distance where maybe to not confuse it too much i will Very often in quantum error correction, uh, errors are denoted codes, a quantum error correction codes are denoted in this way, which basically means that uh, we encode four qubits with n qubits and the distance d, where the distance is the minimum number of qubits which has to have to change for the whole system to change. And it's in more formal terms defined by the uh, minimum coming distance. So the simplest code you describe with three qubits in this notation will be like three one one, right? Uh, uh, three one three. Two. Sorry, just a second for me. It would be like so. Uh, three two, you encode. So it will be. We encode. Uh, three two. One three two. Right, because we need to change two qubits here for the whole system to change. So one qubit is encoded in three. In three, okay. and we need to change. Uh, okay, and the length of the operators will, of the logical operators, will always be bigger and equal to the distance d, because of the property that I just described, and also. Uh, because I'm right now um, describing important mat matrix metrics for quantifying how well our uh, quantum error correction code functions, which will be later important in interpreting our results. So, for example, another important thing is that if we have the number of errors and T will denote the number of errors from now on, uh, that can a surface code can successfully correct. Then it is determined by the floor of the distance minus one divided by two. Always. Always. Yes. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, I mean, in in the basic quantum error correction codes. So you know, STN code and seven qubit code, based on the stabilizer formalism. Maybe this this would be better. Now, two important things for which I will again draw something to uh, maybe help you create an intuition is the threshold value and the pseudo threshold value. So, first of all, maybe. Um, I will draw it here. This is for an intuition, it's not any specific results. So for, first of all, if we have some codes from the same family, so for example, from, from the um, surface codes, then um, it so happens that they will always, their performance will always be uh, meet in a single point. And this point denotes something that is called the threshold. Uh, yes, of, of course, of course. This is the physical error rate and the logical error rate. And uh, this other threshold codes to belong to the same family? Or? Uh, usually they are used to compare the codes of the same family, but they don't have to necessarily. And it's useful um, because. Really? Sorry? Really? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> it is, yes. Uh, and also, if you notice the way I drew it, uh, is that, well, maybe their performance won't be worse necessarily. They will be asymptotically better. But uh, at some point, the ones that were the best at the beginning, so where the physical error rate was small, then become the worst after this threshold. So this is why it's useful to find it, basically. So at the horizontal axis, you have the physical- Physical error rate. Error rate. Physical yes. Error. And here, here, the logical error rate. So the whole logical operation. So error rate is just like probability of an error. Yes. And logical error rate- Is the probability that- um, It's not detected. Right? Exactly, yes. yes. Because logical errors will not get detected and this is what we don't want to happen. And then uh, the pseudo threshold, which is a bit more important in this work, I would say, is usually, this is the same axis, the same ones, um, and they are in a log logarithmic notation, so it won't be exactly the same. But now if we want to, have an objective measure of how well our code performed, uh, it will, for some point, it will be lower than this uh, asymptote, and then it will be better. So this is the same axis, and we find the point at which they cross each other. And this is that the physical error rate is equal to the logical error rate, so then, the dotted uh, line. Entire operation of error correction does not help any much because logical exactly. is smaller. Exactly. Yeah. So it basically means that it doesn't uh, make any sense to use yes. this technique uh, after this point. Exactly, okay. yes. Uh, are there any questions? If not, then we can okay. proceed. I, I just don't believe this result, but <laughs> okay. What, what then? Uh, that, uh, I mean, they all intersect at a single point, but at least they... I will show you the results later okay. on for our surface code. Okay. We'll see. Yes. Now, the minimum weight perfect matching algorithm, which, to be honest, this is from our paper, but I don't think it's very helpful when I looked at it at home. And so, do I have time to draw it? You still have, let's say, uh, 20 minutes. Okay, then so I will draw it. Yes. So first of all, let's say we have our surface code. Then we create something that is called the boundary dummy nodes. So you don't see it so far, but maybe I won't draw them all, but Oh, 
Okay, so uh, as you see, it's as if we created. Oh, yeah. So if we drew a line through each of the squares, right, and then met it at the uh, point that is most out here, this is a semicircle. Then we create each dummy node, which is around there. And it's it's quite complicated. So, so I am sorry if I don't explain perfectly, but then we cross out the ones that are intersecting with the semicircle. So what we will be left with, I will. So we have some ancillary qubits. Yes. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be qubits because this is a decoder. Okay. So we are giving classical data and we work with it classically. Mm. What we are then left with is. And there are also ancillary qubits or whatever uh, inside the product. Uh, yes, that are used to measure their ancillary qubits, yes. This is what we're left with when we cross out the surface code and we're left cross out the dummy node, which we don't need. This is what we will be left with. And then let's say I will change the errors to a bit flip. on this qubit, so it's qubit three. So then we will also have a minus one here, because th this one corresponds to this qubit and this qubit. So here we have a bit flip, and then here we also will have a syndrome of minus one. So this is what we have so far. Now, if we draw the qubits back here, but without the surface code, And then we draw the syndromes as a dot. This is from graph theory. So this is why uh, it might seem confusing. Yeah. Actually, I will, I will send you my note, which is uh, written on dotted paper. So it should be easier to understand than drawing it here. So, all right. And then we have checkers rules. So we can jump over any qubit from those, uh, those affected syndromes as far as the quote unquote board allows. So we will be able to jump here then here. Oh, and what stops us are the boundary nodes. So we cannot jump, jump any farther. And here, let's say, and it will be here. And then we have something of, this is the same distance as this, as this, and as this. And we assign a one to each uh, distance here. And for those of you acquainted with uh, graph theory, you might recognize either minimum weight or perfect matching, um, where perfect, perfect matching is called when we have no two sides are touching the same vertex. And then we, then we perform any possible ways of constructing it. So let's draw this graph here. Of course. Yes. Yes. So a perfect matching, for example, would be either this, just this line of length one, or for example, those two lines here, which both have length one. Those are the possibilities here. And we want to have a perfect matching that has minimum weight. So here it would be just the green part. And then we plot it again onto the qubits and see which qubit it crosses. So that's the basics of it. I think I will show you uh, my notes because oh, if you're curious. 
how it works because they're um, drawn step by step there. And if you don't see it on a dotted line, it might be more difficult. So to summarize, first of all, we get just our classical syndromes of minus one or plus one. Mm -hmm. Then we map it onto a graph. Mm -hmm. And from this graph, we find uh, a perfect matching of minimum weight. And this, this uh, matching will correspond directly to a qubit. It might be one qubit, it might be two or more. There on my notes is one case, so this, where it works, but also a second case with, where it does not work. So here is the second point where this whole structure might not work. First was when we had the logical errors. Second here is where, when the decoder fails. So in this case, plotted here, you have two times two or three times three lattice. So altogether, yes. nine cubic classes auxiliary. How many errors you can correct in this way or detect first? I would say three. three. So look, so in the notation you use here, you would be like uh, how many qubits you encode into this uh, structure and how many you can, errors can you correct? So how many, so you will have eight data qubits and then eight ancilla qubits. So 17 in total. It's for the uh, listener to understand what is the relation of this nice picture to the code you uh, want surface code to construct yes because later on you will make this lattice larger yes and it's good for us to understand uh, what you will like make it larger and larger yes okay mm -hmm. so now um something that the professor has hinted at but i am very curious because we had this situation happen once so based on the information that i have given does anyone beside the professor who knows have any idea of what our structure would be for asymmetric noise. So noise where, uh, let's say, the Z errors happen twice as likely as X errors. No? Mm, not yet. That's all right. Well, now a very brief physical uh, motivation for why in general, we have the asymmetric noise. There are many noise models uh, into which I will not get because I don't know them. But uh, in general, we can we can split the whole process of uh, of the level of noise by two parameters, which is first relaxation time and then dephasing time. And dephasing time results in only phase flip errors, so Z errors. But relaxation time results in both. So you see the general asymmetry here. It might not be as simple as that, but that's, that's generally how it works. So now our proposed design. So it is to make a rectangular lattice instead of a square lattice. That's it. So for example, here our purpose was to create the simplest code uh, that would correct two Z errors for each X error. And this is how we could per perform it. So for example, this is asymmetric three, five surface code where three denotes the distance uh, of the vertical distance and the ZL, the horizontal distance. All right, so the general premise is we make those DX, DZ surface codes, which have, which are rectangular, which corresponds to the level of noise that, or, or the asymmetry of noise. Now, for example, you already can see that while we will have three logical errors here, one, two, and three uh, logical Z errors will have much more X logical errors, right? Because we widen the lattice. And this will result in some small problems with our results, right? Because it's not only that it's better in terms of correcting Z errors, but it's slightly worse at correcting X errors. Sorry, so in short, 
for asymmetry, we see that your uh, lattice is not a square but rectangle. Yes. And somehow you can adjust the size, the shape yes. of the rectangle to the asymmetry to mm -hmm. the relative probability of errors yes. in G and X. Yes, yes precisely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, important, maybe what I told you already that the logical errors are represented here. So, for example, again, to um, show you this again, uh, this, let's say, a stabilizer works on the zeroth qubit, the fifth, and tenth at the same num uh, numbering convention, so in the reading order. And that so far is all you need to know, I would say, the most important part. So now results. Um, one of the more important parts were to try to find the threshold and the pseudo threshold. And we can change the asymmetry of noise we could change um, the distance of our code. So it can be three, five or three, seven, for example. And almost, also importantly, compare it to symmetric codes. So for example, three, three code presented here mm -hmm. or five, five code. So it would be interesting to check whether, for example, bigger square code five, five would perform better or worse than our three, five code. So here already we can see um, the threshold. This is the most important part to take away from this picture. Well, they compare uh, physical error rate to logical error, error rate. So just the same as I drew in this picture. And you might not see it very well, but the blue line is the symmetric tree tree code. The orange line is R asymmetric 3-5 code, and the green light is the bigger 5-5 five, five, five code. So again, this is the dotted line is where the physical and uh, logical error rate meet. meet. And let's say, let's see. Um, A, so the upper picture is checking uh, phase errors, and the second one, bit errors bit flip errors. And you can already see how the orange line uh, is on top, generally speaking, uh, with phase flip error. So it's even better than the uh, symmetric 5-5 code. But on the lower picture, so what I told you about the bigger number of logical x errors, it's on the on the bottom. So it's worse than even the 3 3 code in this case. And it results from the fact that I mentioned that we have more uh, logical x errors than z errors. Now, in our numerical comparisons, where on the left you can see uh, the variation in pseudo threshold with respect to asymmetry. I will show you the picture uh, from which those results are in a second, but I marked in red the numbers after which it, the pseudo threshold starts to decrease. So what we want is the threshold to be as high as possible, as long as possible. So in here, we have another success in that the asymmetric code is the lowest on the list. If you don't see it, uh, here's the number for the 5-5 code and here's the number for the 3-3 three, three code. So after, <clears throat> after it, it uh, plateaus. So it becomes worse. And the second picture, maybe it's not as informative, but here we can see uh, the limit of the threshold with respect to the change of asymmetry. So, the general thing to take away from this picture is that it tends to half threshold, so or 0.5 threshold. And this is arguably the most important result from our work. Uh, the numerical results were previously stated. But here is the change in pseudo threshold. Uh, with respect to change in asymmetry. So this is change in asymmetry of noise. So how much more the errors will we get for each x error? 
And this is where the pseudo threshold is. I know it might be more confusing because now the threshold is not represented as a line, but is um, an argument here. So look, if we have small asymmetry, then the here, those colors grouped here are the symmetric surface codes. So in this case, three, three, five, five, and seven, seven. So they are on top, which would be fairly obvious because they are symmetric and this is what they were built for. But, and our codes are worse. But then we pass the uh, threshold here. It's not D threshold, but A threshold. And our codes wind up on top with the code with largest symmetry, very fast becoming uh, the best performing. Units here, so asymmetry of noise. This is uh, ten, or let's say this, you change the color at let's say seven. So I think seven it was how many color. how many z errors for every x error. Ah, so ten means already enormous asymmetry, like ten times larger. Yes. yes. Uh, so this is probably why it winds up on top, and this is the plateau that I was talking about. They decrease uh, a little bit. All of them. Yeah, but this plateau corresponds to the case where practically all errors are of the single kind because all yes. others are very unlikely. Yes, exactly. Uh, but also, you might see uh, maybe the final remark from this is how grouped the symmetric ones are and how uh, different the asymmetric ones. So, if we were choosing a code for our asymmetry of noise, it would be important to check what asymmetry we have and then. Uh, the corresponding best uh, asymmetric surface code. So basically, to adjust the shape of the rectangle. Exactly. To the of because the those the changes surface. into the threshold are very big, mm -hmm. relatively, of course. So, uh, to summarize, our proposed service code design is one that has a different distance for x and z, which correspond to logical errors. And then uh, we perform some experiments, run them many times. And important thing to note is all of those experiments were classical in nature, because the important thing in here is how well the decoder performs on this specific surface code designs. But the surface codes are very much used in quantum computing, for example, on IBM systems. So, um, well, in all the cases where asymmetry was present, our asymmetric codes performed better than the symmetric ones. But uh, when we studied only the X errors, they performed much worse, even than the symmetric codes, maybe much is a relative term, but they did perform worse, well, um, worse than just the symmetric ones, even of smaller distance. Uh, and this is why it's important to note that this is a useful result, I think, but it has to be studied more extensively to be able to model how well to choose a specific uh, surface code dimensions to a specific noise model on a machine. And this is, I think, all. This is a, uh, a sonnet about quantum error correction, which summarizes basically the everything up to surface codes that we have discussed. Uh, and while uh, those of you who do not have questions can read it, are there any other questions? So thank you very much. Thank you. A very nice talk and you have perfect time. And of course, you will recognize Daniel Gottesman now in Canada in Waterloo is one of the, let's say, founding fathers of quantum error correction. But anyway, yeah, for all of you who prepare the PhD thesis, this thesis was really good because you wrote the thesis, and basically almost everybody doing quantum error correction starts with quantum information. So I could only wish you to put that up in your influential thesis. Is the poem also from the thesis? No, I, well, but anyway, I recall, I know this poem, which is nice, yes, in the thesis. It's not obligatory to include poem into thesis, but it's one option. But no, let's uh, go back to the talk of Ola. Are there any questions? Who would like to start? Yes, please. Uh, in the past, in which you, I have 
Very much so. Well, maybe something I didn't mention is that there are basically three pieces to the puzzle of how to approach quantum error correction. First is the general structure. So here we chose surface code. Second is a design. So our design was the asymmetric rectangle and then the decoder. So here we chose minimum weight perfect matching, which I think is probably the most uh, common one. But we can, while I don't think we could tweak this, especially because the classical uh, minimum weight perfect matching algorithm is already very much optimized, we can choose a different decoder or build one spe specifically for this purpose. Yes. Other questions? 